Jesus at the time, dear beloved Sangha, everyone looks very beautiful from here. Today is the 6th of June in the year 2019. We are in the new hamlet called Kutin Bridge. And we are on our fifth day of the retreat. And everyone is uh, happier, more smiley, you can see, more relaxed. And everyone had enjoyed the good food very much. Right? <laughs> it's not just the good food that had nourished us, it's the practice that had nourished every one of us very much. And also the presence of the beautiful community of practitioners. A community of very kind, loving people. Somehow, everyone who had come to Trumpet had become kinder, more loving. I guess nobody really pushed our buttons, right? So everyone is doing their best to take care of themselves, so they're not going walking around and push people's buttons. And so that's why we are kinder, more, more peaceful. So the environment, you can see how it, that it's very important to have a loving and supportive environment. And the loving and supportive environment really help to bring out the best in us, the beauties and the goodness in us. And these wonderful seeds make us happy. And I'm sure though you have moments of distress, moments of a lot of things coming up inside. Right? And, um, and you know that this is a really good place for these kind of things to unfold. Because they're part of us. They're seeds in us. And they have been watered for so long. And so, seeing this loving environment with the practice and with the support of the community, it's good that they come up. Sometimes we need to invite them to come up so that we can face them, embrace them, work with them, transform them. Because the way to really transform these unwholesome qualities and wholesome seeds in us are really to acknowledge them, to recognize them, to embrace them, because they are really our inner child, they are our inner, the wounded child inside us. And every one of us has this wounded child inside. And, um, you know, we never really learn how to take care of this wounded child inside. And so this is a really good place for them, for the wounded child to unfold so that we can take care of her, take care of her. And as we have learned also in these past few days how the practice is really engaged in everything we do, that it is not just here in the meditation hall that we practice mindfulness. And this is also saying that it's not here in Plum Village that we can practice mindfulness. We can take mindfulness Take the practice home wherever you are and leave them at home. Here in Shan Village, with the Sangha, with the community, we train. We're training ourselves to cultivate new habits. New habits of doing things in a conscious, deliberate way. So that when we go out there, we can you can continue. So you can continue these practices in order to 
continue cultivating joy and happiness and peace and love in ourselves. And also to manage and to work with whatever that may be unfolding that cause that causes discomfort <coughs> or even pain. So we can see how engaged the practices are. It's part of our daily life, it's part of our life. It's not something exclusive just for the monastics or just um, to be practiced in, in the practice center, like here in some village. What we have learned so far, though, through uh, the talks and the presentation, is that we are very much a species, kind of like an animal species, a species that needs consumption to survive. You know, we consume all the time. So somehow the cooking retreat, when you think about it, it's so significant because it's not just learning how to cook. That's a really important part because what we eat, what we consume, determines very much how we are in our body, in our, in our mind. But it's also the way we consume as well. You know, consume in a way that preserve peace, preserve well-being, and preserve a compassion, compassion for ourselves, compassion for the living beings around us, and also compassion for Mother Earth. So today I would like to share with you um, the Buddha's teaching on the four nutrients, the four kinds of food that we consume. Let me write on the board what these kind of foods are. And it's um, what what better time to talk about the nutrients than the cooking to treat me? And it is one of those really essential practices, essential teachings for uh, our modern time. It was really significant back in the time of the Buddha, but it's more so now in our time. And it's the first food is called edible food. So food that we ingest through our mouth. We don't need to feel the food, right? There's the other kind of food, it's called sense impression, which are the kind of foods that we ingest through our senses, through our contacts, through contacts with our senses and ex external um, stimuli, stimulus. Volition is another kind of food. These are mental entities, mental aspects. You know, that we consume. And the fourth kind of food is called consciousness. And it's another kind of mental food that we feed ourselves every moment of our life, and I'll talk more about them. And when we read, um, we learned in the five mindfulness trainings the other day, and we know that in the fifth mindfulness training it's about consumption. And in, this, um, in the text of the five uh, mindfulness trainings, these four nutrients are mentioned. 
And so it's really significant to talk about them so that for us to understand um, the fifth marker's journeys and also to really understand how consumption is affecting us in every aspect of our life. And because we are social, we are, we are social beings, uh, we consume, we consume all the time, not just three times a day, billions a day, but we consume in every moment. So let's start with the edible food. So edible food are food that we consume through our mouth. And in this retreat, we from we plan, plan how to, how to cook and learn how to consume edible food. And um, usually when we talk about food, edible food, each one of us has like different experiences and different, different, different relationships to the food. Some are wholesome, some are neutral, and some are quite painful, you know, this relationship with food. And for most of us, there's a lot of um, craving that comes up around food, and especially for the monastics, you know, that give away a lot of stuff, kind of like to lead this life. The only thing now that we can consume is food. And so that's like an issue that many of us have to work with. And not just the monastics, I'm sure every one of you is also. And because it's one of those, uh, food is one of the central pleasures that the Buddha had always warned us about. Central pleasures, that we eat for sinful pleasure, for sensual pleasure. Not, not out of a necessity to nourish our body, to survive, but it becomes like a craving for sensual pleasure, to eat good to eat. Does that ring a bell for us, for some of us? And then we have like all this kind of relationship with them that are not very young. They're not, not very wholesome. Some of us eat to forget. To you know, forget the suffering, this nagging feeling that threatens something uncomfortable is threatening to come up. Or just to forget, not to, have, not to experience what we experience inside. And so when there's discomfort, you know, when you feel something is opening up inside that we don't want to deal with, we go to the fridge and we start to consume. And so a lot of eating disorders come out in our relationship with food. And especially with young people. I am. Um, Usually in the summer retreat, I have, um, I facilitate a young adult group. And, you know, these are beautiful young, young ladies, beautiful, healthy looking, you know, full of energy, and yet, so many of them have eating disorders. Very sad, and they're, they're like struggling a lot with it because the disorder comes, the eating disorder comes out of a distorted image of themselves, and also this craving that they probably don't know the root of it and just go into the food for satisfaction and then eating too much and they have this like pink, you know. Um, getting it out. So this is a, a, something that a lot of young people are experiencing. 
people have come here, but a lot of them out there are to have problems with this kind of the teenage people. And a lot of suffering around these issues for young people. We've read the five contemplations and we've learned already um, in the last talk. Sister Eleni was talking about the five contemplations. But the one line that really hit me strongly every time I read the four co five contemplations is the one that made it see in such a way that reduced the suffering of living beings, preserve our planet, and stop contributing to climate change. Yes, of course, it's eating for my well-being. I need food, you know, for energies to <coughs> practice, survive, to do what, to do things that are nourishing for me. But also, we're learning how to eat in a way that we can minimize the suffering that is caused by consumption for other living beings. And also to, to protect our planet, Mother Earth. The other day, a friend uh, approached me and talked about climate change because I mentioned about it in the, in the, in the first talk about the climate change. She was a bit distressed about it. And, um, and we too are a bit distressed about it here in the community. We, we, do, we, we do the best that we can to go in the direction of uh, minimizing our consumption and our carbon imprints in order to protect Mother Earth. And, um, I always reminded that we need to really protect ourselves from falling into despair because when we are in despair due to the situations around us like the climate change for instance and many other social issues that are happening in our time that we may be we may not have the you know, freshness and happiness and joy in order to offer to the world, in order to do something about climate change. So one of the things that um, in October, to just uh, share, there was a um, there was a panel, there was a, a, a meeting in Korea. It's called the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And it is said that um, the climate, the, the temperature had, rate, had risen to one degree in the past decade. And that within the next 11 to 15 years, we will climb up to about 1.5 degree. When we get 1.5 degree, we want to be deal, no big deal. We would even feel it, right? Well, it would have a really devastating effect on the planet, including the melting of the, the glaciers in the North Pole and the South Pole, for instance. Mm. And along with that, a lot of other issues, such as flooding, storms, you know, like quite, quite grave, quite grave situations. And that they say that this 
it's like we have this window of 11 or 15 years to do something about it, to reverse this in the increase, or at least to keep it a base. And so, um, but it needs, it needs an effort for every single person. Do you think that's possible? Can we do something to it? Someone's nodding. I think it's, it would be really good to have that discussion on this so that we can find different ways in order to protect, you know, to protect Mother Earth in, the, in order to prevent this increase of the, the temperature, the overall temperature. And um, the, the UNESCO has had, um, did a research and shown that the meat industry is one of the biggest contributions to this climate change, to the deterioration of natural resources and the pollution of the earth. You know, through the through the raising of cattle for meat and also through the cutting of the forest, we need to build a house for these livestock. And so we just said that if we go vegan, well, UNESCO said if we consume meat, meat we lessen meat consumption by 50%, we can make a tremendous impact on re reversing the climate change. But this friend yesterday mentioned that if every one of us go vegan, which is a you know like a dietary shift to plant-based food, we would really stop. This, this woman of our planet. Even if, you know, not taking into consideration of other factors, just, uh, just going vegan already could have a tremendous impact. And it was from the studies that our community, Thai, had decided that we would go vegan. In our community, before we were, eat, we were eating dairy also, we were vegetarian. But in the last 10 years, we have been eating vegan. And actually, Buddhists in other countries, including Vietnam, they're, they're actually vegan. It's only in the West. I guess, I guess um, it's a way to help uh, Westerners, you know, to approach vegetarian in a way that they don't feel, you know, completely cut out from the cheese that are really famous here in France. Um, but since this study, Thai have decided for the community with the vegan, vegan diet. Because according to this friend, the vegan diet is a solution to the climate, the climate change. And every time I, um, you know, every time I sit in a retreat like this and looking at you know, this number of people, and sometimes you know, like during the summer retreat, we would have up to like a thousand people in the village. Right now, we have about the same number of people in the upper hundred for a business retreat. The kind of serious people up there, right? <laughs> this is and and um, to think about it, like 200, 300 people, 500 people, a thousand people would go vegan in a, a week, one month, in the case of the summer retreat. And think about how happy the animals 
you feel. If they know that, wow, there are people here who don't even want to touch them. <laughs> and so, just that alone, if you think about it, it brings a lot of joy and happiness to know that this week we have to spare the lives of other beings. As we try, the Buddha used an example um, when he talked about edible food. It's a story of a couple, a young couple with their son crossing the desert. And midway through the desert, they bought enough food to cross the desert. But midway through the desert, they ran out of provision. And so the couple decided that the boy, kill the little boy to eat in order to survive and cross the desert, otherwise all three of them will be perished. And so they made that decision because they know when they get to the other side of the desert, so they will give birth to more children. And so they, they kill the little boy and hang it on their shoulder and every time they eat the flesh of the child and you just cry and beat their chest and pretty painful. Can you imagine how painful it is to eat your child? Well, <laughs> well, this is a very drastic example that the Buddha shared to tell us that we have to be really mindful because what we are consuming, we may be consuming our children. Because the way you consume, that contribute to climate change, is affecting the globe, and is affecting the children, the, the, the future of our children. We're actually consuming them in a way, in a sense. But also the animals that are eating our children as well. And so it's not just this couple who have killed their children, their son to eat. We're continuing to consume our children all the time through the way we live and through the way we consume. And one of the story that uh, this friend was, uh, I was really moved and she shared about this little girl. Autistic. And, um, you know, she said, she told the grown-ups that, you guys are destroying our future. And that we have to do something about it. And so, she got her friends to come together and went on sort of like a demonstration on Friday, so every Friday they would do a demonstration for the climate change. We need to bring more awareness. We need to do something about this. And it becomes like an international movement. Children speaking out for climate change. It's not, it's not, it's so inspiring. To have this little girl, you know, speaking up, taking action in a way that is affecting globally. This 
little girl could do it, I think for us, as a community, we could also do it. And it's through the practice of mindfulness, mindful of consumption and how it affects our body, our mind, how it affects the body of the planet, that it will that we are making a difference. We can make a difference. And um, I've been watching a lot of uh, documents on on health. Somehow a sister sent me a link on health and I, you know, like one, one document after the next. And what was really um, What was like a mind uh, opening for me was the eye opening for me was how much consumption is linked to very chronic illnesses and diseases. And with all the toxins that are in the food right now, the water and the air. There's a pretty high increase in chronic illnesses and diseases. And so I think in our lifetime, you know, in the modern time, I think we need to be super mindful of what we take in. That we need to be practicing mindfulness and looking deeply into the food that we consume so that we can choose wisely, we can choose in a way that supports the well being in our body and our mind. Not just for the planet, but also for this little earth here. Yeah. Because we're part of the earth. We're coming from the earth and we'll be returning to the earth. So this miniature earth, we need to take care of it as well. You know, each one of us, this body that we have, is a miniature earth. We think about it. That's belonging to the larger earth. And that we need to really take good care of this earth by mindful consumption, by consuming in the way. That can prevent chronic illnesses, you know, taking over our body. And so we can see that a vegan diet is the answer, you know, not just protecting our planet, protecting the future of our children but also protecting our body as well. And I know more and more people are waking up to this truth, and that more and more people are becoming vegetarian or vegan. And um, Thai had, um, Thai had called practitioners to cut meat by 50%, which means that out of 30 days that we would eat a vegan diet for 15 days. That's not too bad, right? That's not too bad. But that already has a tremendous impact on the planet, on our health as well. And let alone if we are adopting a vegan diet for life, how much that I do to the planet and to our own well-being. So this is an invitation for those of you who have not yet adopted a vegan diet to consider you know, doing it 15, 50%. 15 days out of 30 days a month.
And one of the things that I have been doing is, um, of course, we live in a in monastic, we live very simply. We don't have a lot of stuff. That's another way to help contributing to stopping the climate change. Less in consumption. But one of the things that I have done um, on my personal you know, level is that I love trees. And so every spring I would walk around and dig up my baby plants. Because if they're, they'll be cut, you know, like they'll be cut down by the lawnmower, they'll be walked on. So I, I take them and put them in little pots. And I nurse them. And I wanted to grow a forest. We have plenty of space here to plant forests. But I'm planting them around here. And there's such they give me such joy because every time I walk around them, they're like my babies. I call them my babies. And some of them are like three times higher than me now, taller than me. And I would come and do hug and meditation like every time I walk across these trees. Some of them are here. You know, I just call them. They're not big enough for me to do this. Maybe in 30 years. So I hug them. And, um, and so this is one of the things that we could do. Grow trees as a way to, as a way to, you know, to offer something back to Mother Earth. And also as a way um, to preserve the planet for our children's children. So, I have more than 30 trees now planted all over the places. <laughs> and also a lot of babies that are growing in my little the nursery. Um, these baby plants. And it, it gave me enormous joy to see them and also to touch them. And they're, they're nourishment because nature is, is always there to nourish us. They're love, an expression of love of Mother Earth offering to us. And if we, we can be present for these beauties, for for these things, they can just nourish us so much. They're part of us. Can you imagine if there's no trees? And there are places there's no more trees. What a loss that would be for us, physically, mentally, spiritually. So planting trees. It's one of those ways for us to nourish ourselves, to bring well-being to our body and our mind. And it's completely connected to consumption. Because it's through awareness of what we consume that we can see this interconnectedness between us and the mother of us. Us and nature. Us and the climate and everything else. And so eating is a very powerful practice. And it could be an awakening process as well. If we can be there and every morsel of food that we eat. So let us uh, listen to one sound of the bell for us to breathe before we go into the second food. We have um, the teachings called manifestation only teachings. 
and um, Tai had given several retreats, um, manifestation on teachings, and they were very profound teachings. And I, I guess I share with you that I, I was um, studying psychology when I was at the university, and this, this uh, I came here during the time that I was teaching you know, manifestation on teachings in the, the really Buddhist psychology. And I was blown away by how profound Buddhist psychology was and how it totally relate to, you know, my life. And so I'm going to share with you a very simplicity, simplicity, simple teachings on manifestation on you. And so here's our consciousness. In our consciousness, in our consciousness, there are many different layers and levels. There are eight levels that Thay always talked about. Eight levels. In the deepest level of our consciousness is what we call, call the store consciousness. The store consciousness. And as this word store speaks, what this means that it stores all kinds of seeds. It preserves all kinds of seeds. It's like the soil that has that has all kinds of seed in it. And so it's a whole spectrum of seeds, from the most negative to the most positive seeds in the depths of our being in, this, in our store consciousness. So the seed of mindfulness, concentration, and insight, these are the seeds that make us a Buddha, right? The Buddha is someone who has cultivated these three seeds to the highest, highest potential. And we have these seeds in us, these wholesome seeds. So I guess that's one spectrum, and one extreme to the other extreme, which is, what is the other extreme? Evil. Someone said, yeah, violence. Agreed. So, all the negative seeds are also in our consciousness. And the example, the personification of all these evil seeds and, and wholesome seeds are Mara, in our tradition, Mara. In other words, the whole spectrum from the most positive to the most negative, everything in it. So, in a depth, of our being, you can say, in the soil of our mind, in the depths of the soil of our mind, we have all kinds of seeds. And seeds are really potentials. They're there, ready to manifest if they're in their conditions. Just like the seeds. The seeds, you know, when you, um, when you walk on the land, like if you go out to the happy farm and, you know, you, you look at the you work on the you move the grass and the water, even if you may not put any seeds in, something will come up. Weeds, but well, we call weeds because we're not growing them. But they're actually food for us. Every day I would go out there and just collect a bowl of weeds and boil them to eat. Them. They're just really wholesome and really good. The medicine, actually. Anyway, so. So, um, so we have all kinds of seeds in here, waiting for the right conditions to manifest. And what are these conditions? What are the conditions to help them manifest? So there's another, I'll get back to that question. <laughs> there's another upper level of consciousness, it's called the manas. 
which is responsible for an idea of a separate self, separate existence. Uh, we'll, we'll have a chance to talk about that at another time. But for the sake of our talk on nutrients, I, I want to go on. And then the mind. This is called mind consciousness. You know, a mind that we can actually have access to, can experience, like, for example, um, love or anger or loneliness. We can actually feel it, right, in our mind, right? It's an experience that we can have access to. We can really touch with our mind. So we have our mind consciousness. And then the other five consciousnesses are the sense consciousnesses. There are the eye consciousness, the ear consciousness, the nose consciousness, the tongue consciousness, and the body consciousness. In other words, my eyes, organs, the organs come in touch with sights, objects, Objects of sight of my eyes, which I come in touch with. These two things come together, it gives rise to an awareness, to a consciousness. So that's what it means by consciousness, is that organs, so their sense, their senses, the, their, their sense organs come in touch with sense objects, gives rise to consciousness, sense consciousnesses. And so, what I am coming in touch with, you know, right now I'm looking at you and you are the object of my eyes consciousness. What I come in touch with through my senses goes down into my store consciousness and it touch up seats in there. Touch our seats in here and be seen with manifest in my mind consciousness, in my mind. So, right now, I'm not angry. Anybody angry right now? That doesn't mean that your anger is not there, right? Your anger is sleeping down here, they're dormant in here. They're sleeping. And a lot of times, you want them to sleep down there because when they Manifest, they rage up here and it creates like this really dark place in our mind where it's like a storm that's passing by and it can create a lot of you know, disasters. Disasters that hurt us and hurt other people, and disasters that we Manifest, it takes us away. You know, we act from it that we would regret very much later on. So, so during our retreat, everything that we've learned and all the activities that we have been you know, participating, are already encouraging the seed of mindfulness to grow. Because when the seed of mindfulness grows up here, it's like it's bringing a light into our mind. It's like bringing a, mind, a light into this mind so that we can see clearer, we can experience deeper, we can feel also clear what's there inside ourselves and what's there around us. So, what does it mean by sense impression as food? It's that whatever we consume goes in here and we touch our seeds in here. And the seeds that manifest here really determine the quality of our mind. Did you see that? So, the seed of mindfulness is manifest in our mind. You know, we're more mindful, we're more loving. 
positive seeds tends to trigger other positive seeds, and negative seeds like anger triggers other ne other negative seeds and and bring up the other negative seeds. So what does the anger really trigger? You know, apart from like this fire that's raging. Anybody? For you? Sadness. Because it's sadness. Fear. Fear, number one. We usually act out of anger due to fear also. Violence. Guilt, violence. So, 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 this is to say that the wholesome seeds, they trigger all the wholesome seeds and the other wholesome seeds manifest. Like seeds of mindfulness, it brings up a whole you know, gamut of wholesome seeds. But the negative seeds also bring up a lot of wholesome, uh, unwholesome seeds as well. And so, we have to be really mindful of what we consume because what we consume determines the quality of our being, our mind. It affects our mind and it affects our body because mind and body are really two aspects of the same reality. What happens in the mind affects the body. And we know that very well. We know about stress and how stress is affecting. It's a mental energy, right? And it's affecting our body so, so much. babysitting their children with like a tablet right? and the game and so on. And it's our reality right now, you know, all over the world, not just here in the West, in Vietnam also, in China also. It's a phenomenon where we're just putting so much energy into kind of things into consuming the internet and um, watering so many whole unwholesome seeds We're consuming unwholesome seeds all the time unwholesome qualities all the time and it's the use of the internet to the point where it interferes with our daily life you know with our work with our social life, social interaction, our relationship, our studies, and you know, so much more. Is that familiar? For me, it's not familiar. 
but maybe it's something that they just talk about on the internet, on news. But is something happening out there to you guys? It, it, it creates you know, the use of the internet to the point where it creates psychological disturbance, <coughs> disturbances. And um, when these people go offline, they feel as jittery and they're anxious. And I can see how tempting it is to go on with the internet. You know, like if you're living by yourself and you don't have like the kind of wholesome food for your mind, then you would go into this kind of things because kind of like kills time, right? You think it kills time? Well, I see that it's a really good way to run away from myself. You know, like confronting what's there. You know, like we talked about how consume in order to forget more food. But we also consume in order the internet in order to forget what's there. And that's kind of sad because we're running away from ourselves all the time. Because the way out of our problem is not through, you know, like projecting our mind to this tablet, the, the screen. The way out is really goes inside. To feel and to experience what is happening inside in order to understand. That's the way we transform the suffering inside ourselves and bring clarity to our mind. And the way here, you know, with the internet, that's the only way that most of us are running away from ourselves. And, and sadly, there's about 38% of the general population who have this internet addictive disorder. That's a open number of people, right? 38% that's a lot of us who are having this kind of disorder. And now people are talking about it. You know, like they have this summit online that talks about how to deal with this internet disorder. And, and we, when you come here to Plum Village, we didn't do this to you because we thought you might be really offended. But for the teens, when they come here, we take away their, ta their tablets or their iPhone. Maybe we should try that one day with you guys. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll, we'll still have to retreat and we'll say, you know, like, internet free retreat. I think, I think maybe half of you will not come, or even more. But that is so good to take away. We take, we take the, the, the phone away from the team so that they can really have time and energy to interact with all the teens and to participate in the retreat to really live every moment of their life so that they're not just, you know, get hooked on their tablet, on their phone. And um, I, I felt really tempted to do it for this retreat. I didn't tell my sister about it, you know. And I was hoping that the sister who did the, you know, the, the evening session, the arrival evening, that she would mention it and listen to her. And she only said, put away your phone or like silence it. She didn't say, lock it up. I would say, lock it up. Or give them to me and I'll keep it for a week. <laughs> and so, minimizing it is one way in order to help us consume it in a wholesome way, you know, so that we can really have time for our beloved ones. We really have time to take care of one another. And uh, we were talking about like, the climate change. And I was sharing with my group, my family, my daughter sharing family, that. Like, why are people putting so much energy into like, 
Didn't set it up. No, she had to create his own dream and suffering. But you could just put that energy in working for, for the art, for, for reversing the climate change. Well, the same thing with this. You know? You can just lock it up. Lock it away. Put it in a closet. Put the luggage in. Put it in the luggage. Lock it up. Put it in a closet. So that we can have time and energy to see what is happening right now with the planet, with the climate change, so that we can, you know, we can do something about it. We can put our energy and our mind into working for the planet, which is really working for ourselves and the future of our children. Because this climate change thing, to be a consumer in a lifetime. We think that, you know, I'll be dead already. It will happen like I'm, I'm gone. Or well, maybe not. It could happen in 10 years or 15 years if we don't do anything, you know, to, to stop this, this increase of the temperature. So 38% of the general population are as you will have having this kind of order, disorder, as a psychological disorder to think about it. So we should like pat ourselves on the shoulder, those of us who are here, it's like we took a week away to be in a place like this. Where we minimize, we use we minimize the use of the phone when we are cultivating you know, this capacity to live deeply every moment of our life and just to be there for ourselves. Isn't that wonderful, you guys? You guys are, you know, worthy of respect, worthy of offering. That's an expression that they use for the Buddha. Worthy of respect and worthy of offering. You know, someone who has to make you know, let go of all the worldly pleasures in order to seek ways to alleviate suffering for himself and for all beings. Someone like the Buddha is worthy of offering, worthy of respect. And so you guys are worthy of offering and worthy of respect this week. My goodness, I have only 30 more minutes, no, 15 more minutes, and I have two more food. Let me just go over really quickly. Volition. What is volition? Volition is the power to choose, the power to determine. I checked that out in the dictionary this morning. The power to choose and the power to determine. Choose to determine. And a real power for us, you see. It's really our deepest desire, our deepest aspiration, our dreams. What is it that we want to do with our life, meaning of our life? It's what motivation is, and it's a need for us. In other words, motivation is what we want to do with our life. And it becomes energy and motivation for us to do what we need to do, to realize that dream, to realize that aspiration. So it's a food, it's a power food, powerful food. And it's food that takes us, you know, on a journey. And for us as monastics, it's our aspiration to transform ourselves and be service to other people. And it's a strong aspiration to be useful in the world. And so that's why we let go of everything, even our beloved ones, our family, and you know, start this journey, wearing these real clothes, shaving off our hair so that we're not distracted, and we don't have to put too much energy so that we can focus on cultivating inner strength cultivating compassion, cultivating love. <coughs> and I have to say that taking up this journey
Jenny or Watanabe's journey for me has been a really powerful life transformation. It has been really transformative for me in the last 26 years of my life as a monastic. And um, I cannot say enough how empowering it has been for me to take on this path. And that's because I have the kind of foundation that helped me, you know, to let go of everything there is out there and walk on this path. This is not to say that every one of you should become monastics. <laughs> Yesterday we had a session on monastic, q and on monastic, and so many of you came up, came to the session. I thought, you know, I was trying to kind of fish these young people, you know, to become monastic, and there were like so many older people who came. But it was, it was, um, you know, it was, it was really nice to know that so many of you are interested in monastic life. But, but this is not what I'm trying to say this morning, although, you know, if you choose this path, you make such a difference for your life and for the world, as, as we do as monastics. But it's a kind of, um, this is a, really about mindfulness and the invitation for every one of us to look into ourselves and to see what kind of foundation do we have? Do we have a dream? Do we have an aspiration? Is it wholesome? Does it include other people? Is it useful? Are we useful to the world? So these are the kind of questions that we need to ask ourselves. And um, it's really a deep need inside ourselves to change the world. That's what volition helps us, that it helps. This volition, it is deep aspiration to change the world, to be useful. And you know, the young people in my group, they're like really ideal, you know, people, they want to change the world. That's a really good kind of volition. But let's take action also, not just talking about it, but also take action as well. Because action is the action that matters, not what we say. And um, so we're talking about the environment and the climate change. If we have a desire and a determination to do something from other us, that's a wholesome volition. And once we have a wholesome volition, it also will touch on the wholesome qualities in us that makes us into healthy, healthy people, healthy body and mind. People who are sick mentally or who are depressed, I think a big junk of their issues comes from not knowing, not knowing what to do with their life. And sometimes not motivated to do anything for the goodness of their lives and for other people. And if they can just do something for the goodness of other people, that would really heal them. This, the, a moving story that I, I, I heard when I was in Taiwan, the Thai. We, um, they had this association, this tech, this <coughs> association, it's called the, I don't know how to say, Xu Zi in Chinese? How do you say in Chinese? Xu Zi in Chinese. Where um, it started with one nun, and then it became like a national thing, also international, where they have like hospitals, you know, like relief, like disaster relief programs. You know, go to all over the places. They even went to the United States when we had the Katrina. 
Anyway, one of the things that was so mind-blowing for me was the recycling effort. They, you know, like everywhere you go to Taiwan, they have like these recycling plants. And they would just get like recycling materials from households or even factories. And when you were there, they have like a pile, a mountain of like cameras, you know, like these old cameras where you have like the film and stuff. Well, we don't use this kind of cameras anymore. And they had, they brought them in. And they have like people to kind of disassemble them, like the glass goes to one pile, the, the metal goes to another, plastic to another. And the story is like this. And, and the people who come to work are all volunteers. And so old people we see a lot, but also we also mentally mentally challenge people how to come to work as volunteers to separate these things. And what was really really moving is that these people came to do something, you know, just to like disassemble these these things that are thrown out. But the older people, they have a community. You know, there are people who cook for these volunteers, and they have like, to spend the whole day together. And the old people, they become happier because they have other people to connect with. They're not alone at all in their house. They have like, a community of people that they can interact with, that they can laugh together, that they can share, and they become really healthy people, healthy body and mind. And then these mentally challenged people, they become healthier as well. Because they come into a community where people really care for them. People were listening to them. They were making a difference. And so they're creating healthier people, whether these people are challenged, mentally challenged, or whether they are elderly, lonely elderly, these people are becoming happier and healthier in their body and in their mind just because they have put all their time and effort in doing something wholesome for the, you know, for the planet. And it's through this community of people that they support each other and they are there for each other and they nourish each other. What a beautiful, wholesome position that is, right? Not to talk about this one nun that started out this. There was only one nun who'd seen poverty around her in the 30s. And she wanted to do something about it by giving like these cans. It's just like a piggy bank can to a like, household where they can just put like a penny each day in this can. And after a month, she would collect these cans and she would use this money to help the poor people. That's how it started out. And what kind of foundation that is? An aspiration to do something useful, even in little ways. It can go a long, long way to impact the lives of others and the world. And if you're not sure what kind of volition to take up, you know, wholesome volition, well, just close your eyes and bring your attention. You know, extend your vision to the other side of the globe where people are hungry and suffering, where people don't really have medicine, simple medicine to cure their illness, where there's really no food, no water, people are sick and dying. You know, if, you, if you really look in that direction and see them suffering here and there all over the planet, you know, Maybe that will help give you, give rise to a desire to do something. But you don't have to extend your vision over there. You can just open your eyes and look around you. I mean, you guys are healthy people. You look sufficient. But we know that everyone suffers a lot. And that's the relation for us as monastics. It says, we want to be of service, we want to help. You guys, we want to create an environment where you can come and you feel happy and healthy and where you can build yourself you don't have to take care of yourself. Okay.
kind of food? Consciousness. When we talk about consciousness as food, we're talking about store consciousness. So when we talk about store consciousness, it's it's neither individual, it's not just your consciousness, your store consciousness, not like my store consciousness. It has nothing to do with you. We know that's not the truth. We know that our nature is the nature of interconnectedness. Right? My joy is your joy. Your joy is my joy. Your suffering is, is affecting my suffering. And my suffering is affecting yours. What's happening in China is affecting us intimately here. What's happening with us here is affecting the other side of the globe also. We know that as a reality, especially now in our time with this climate change. And now we know that each of our, each of our action is affecting the whole humanity. The way I consume is affecting everyone else. So even if I'm just planting these little trees, little plants and digging them, walking around and digging these little plants and nursing them into like trees, you know, none of you know it. Even my sisters didn't really pay attention, didn't even know that I'm doing this. You know, now and then I said, can I plant some trees? And said the work coordinator was, you know, get a, a whole bunch of people to help me dig holes and put down the plants and stuff like that. But I know my action counts. You can see some little actions that it has an impact on you. It's affecting the globe. And so, you know, like for, for us to do something with the climate change, I think we don't need to do something like grand. We can do little things in our daily life. Even if nobody notices it, that only us know, it's still happening to many people. So my consciousness is affected by your consciousness. I am made of my ancestors, my parents, my education, my upbringing, my society, society where I was born, society where I was brought up, and I'm continuing to be affected by everyone who's living around me, but also who are sharing the same planet with me right now. So my store consciousness is not just individual. My store consciousness is also collective. So it cannot be just individual, nor just exclusively collective either. Our store consciousness is both individual and collective. And that we're consuming through our consciousness, with our consciousness, through our actions of body, speech, and mind. Our actions of body, and speech, and mind are really actions that we're consuming. Because we read this uh, in the guided meditation this morning, we learned that Actions of body and speech and mind are really our belongings because whatever we produce goes back down for us and water seeps inside. So kind words we say, we don't know how much it affects the other people, but we know that it affects us intimately. You know, it touches on the wholesome seeds in us, but at least it's it strengthening that loving kindness that we have, you know, through, through a kind word. It's Strengthening that seed in the depths of our being, so that it 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 it's stronger and it manifests in order to nourish us. So, in other words, seeds that in ourselves and also in the collective that are significant enough through a lot of watering 
to create a critical mass. And when it becomes a critical mass, it's powerful. It powerfully affects the world. It powerfully affects other people. Does that make sense? <coughs> so in other words, we are watering seeds in ourselves. And these seeds become powerful enough that it dictates our actions, body, speech, and mind. On, a, on, on an individual level and on a larger collective level, it becomes an energy, a critical mass that affects everyone. Kind of scary to think about it if it's something unwholesome, right? The like violence and fear. And this is something that's been that's becoming really collective, like fear. It's becoming really collective. You know, wherever you go, you're like, you know, like, you're really careful. You know, fear is a trigger. Is it true that you have the seed of fear in you? Raise your hand if it ever you do. But wherever you go, or even at home, you have like this inherent fear that's always there in the back of your mind. I remember um, the last retreat. The last retreat, the last cooking retreat. Well, let me just... I, I went to Paris with my sister. And um, we got this ticket that... She got a day ticket to travel all over Paris, you know, a day. And we went, we came back in the afternoon. And then um, we decided not to go in and while we, we had done, we were getting a visa to go to China. And so we got everything we needed. So we went back to our, the house to stay. And um, and afterward, you know, in the evening at about five o'clock or something, six o'clock, we, we decided to take a walk. It was right in, you know, distributed at the 13th. We were taking a walk. And, and we went to like a metro, you know, like the entrance into the metro, and they didn't have like a place where you can buy a ticket. There's no uh, chaos to buy a ticket, more of a machine to buy a ticket. And there was a mother and a daughter wanting to get into the metro, and they didn't have a ticket. And we were like, we were like really happy. Hey, you can offer them these two tickets because we don't need them, and they can use them until midnight. So we were like, hey, you want to have this ticket? And they're like, yeah. and they just, you know, took off really fast. And I thought, I was like, you know, we have a really good intention. And they had so much fear. And that's really rampant in our society, the fear, you know. Even when people have good intention, they offer this ticket that they can use. They didn't have to go to the, uh, another, you know, metro station. They, they can just use this and they don't have to buy it also. And yet, you know, that's one example of how fear is becoming really a collective energy. And when I talk about consciousness, you know, when I'm just reflecting on consciousness, the, 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 the teachings on the second arrow comes, comes to mind. Second arrow is that this is the Buddha had talked about the second arrow. So when someone shot at you with one arrow, that's really painful, right? But if the second arrow is shot at the same place, it's not like twice the amount of pain you have. It could be a hundredfold. And the Buddha said that we're shooting second arrows at us all the time. So someone said something that hurt us. Maybe they said something put down, you know. And then we shoot ourselves like, that's right, I'm not good enough. I'm ugly, I'm not capable of doing anything. We're shooting ourselves with second arrows all the time. You know, like this judgment we have of ourselves. They're not coming from the store consciousness, the seeds of our store consciousness. And that uh, we are shooting at the place that's already really hurt. You know, that's been shot by someone. And we're continuing to shoot 
and got some seeds. And so many other errors, not just the second error, the third, the fourth, the fifth, until we become really depressed. Does that ring a bell? So the way for us to really avoid shooting second arrows is to be mindful of that pain, whatever it is, physical, mental, and just to acknowledge and notice, yes, the pain is there. And that the best thing I can do right now is to breathe and to raise that pain. I don't need to beat myself down with second arrows and third arrows and so forth. I can just simply recognize that the pain is happening and I'm breathing with it to take care of it. For now, this is what I need to do. Once this pain lessens, then I can find a solution to deal with the situation instead of raging in anger. And just go back and take care of my anger right now. Once my anger has calmed down, then I can look into the situation to understand why is it that happened this anger was triggered. So that I can have more clarity into myself instead of, you know, shooting second arrows all the time at myself. So for us, it's important to have a collective consciousness, to have wholesome consciousness by the practice of mindfulness, so that we can help reduce the violence and fear in ourselves and also in the environment. And that's also evolution, a desire to want to do that. That's an evolution, also a wholesome evolution, to work with our consciousness. We start with, with the individual consciousness, with ourselves. And through having a wholesome consciousness, it affects other consciousness around us. And it will help us to create a collective wholesome consciousness. And this is what we do here in Sun Village. You know, we're, we're practicing here with humble nuns, living simply. And you guys are coming to practice with us. And together, you probably got attracted by this collective consciousness that was created here of love and peace. And you come in here and come in, you're becoming a part of this collective consciousness because your wholesome seeds are also water. Seeds of joy and seeds of love and seeds of peace are water. And so we're creating this, this collective consciousness of peace and love. And like I said at the beginning, you know, the beginning of the retreat, that what a pocket of light that's attracting people who are needing the light. You know, with our collective awakening is helping to ripple out and it's affecting the whole globe so that there is a collective awakening in humanity. <coughs> And having a community like us here is one way to combat. Some good word to use, isn't it? It sounds quite bad or like. It's a good way to, to counter, you know, to counteract the negative collective energy of fear and violence that are so everywhere, so rampant everywhere out there in the world. And it's only with the Sangha that we can resist, you know, the temptations <coughs> that are out there. You know, like we're talking about the use of the phone, the internet, this addictive disorder. 
that this is one way as community, practitioning community that could counteract with this kind of disorder, many kind of other disorders out there, including chronic, chronic illnesses and diseases. So you're here, you're eating, you're consuming. <laughs> and you can see it through children, you know, in, in the summer, we have so many children here, and teens, and they're, they're, maybe they, they, they're not, children may not know what the practice is all about. They're just running around and playing and yelling and screaming. And yet, they're consuming. They're consuming peace and consuming love. They're consuming this wholesome collective consciousness that the whole community is cultivating, the whole community is, is cooking. And so, this is what we do here. It's not about learning how to cook these you know, dishes. It's about cooking a collective consciousness that's wholesome and healthy for our consumption and also for the collective, for the consumption of the, the whole humanity of our society and it's just not it's not just for us now in the present moment but also for our future for our children as well because we're feeding them with our collective consciousness so we are really warriors warriors who are peaceful warriors who are working to cultivate and to cook awakening and well-being for our own nourishment and also for the nourishment of the whole humanity. So you guys are worthy of respect and often. Thank you so much for choosing me to come here, choosing to come here, in order to collectively create a critical mass of peace and love to offer to ourselves and to hold the whole humanity. And um, today, I'm so sorry that it's a bit long, We have um, the fundraising team who's here because these are people who have wholesome volition to work for the well-being of not just the monastics but of all of you guys here. And um, the nuns here, we, we wanted to build a nuns' quarter because right now we don't really have a proper place to live. And we wanted to build uh, a nun's quarter where all the nuns can come together and can live together and um, you know so that we can take care of our practice, our health, we can take care of one another so that we can be more present, uh, more available to help people, but also to make more spaces for you. Because once you move into these nun quarters, we have like 60 other places for more people to come. Right now we have to like really have a quota and limit the number of people who come because we don't really have enough spaces. We, you know, some of you have to stay in the jeeps and, that's, and we have to really say no to people and ask them to come as commuters because we don't have enough places. And so this is another way, not just for the nuns, but also uh, for more people to come and practice with us. So thank you so much for, for, for being part of this journey with us and help us to realize our dreams. Our dreams of helping, um, making collective working and our dreams to happen for, for us. Thank you so much. So let us listen to the sounds of the bell, first to breathe, and then we'll stand up with us one another. Mm -hmm.